All right, I see our guest of honor is here. Bill, how's it going, Mac? Yeah, I am. How's it going, Bill? Good. Good, all right. I guess everybody's uh, getting a late start today. Okay, I'll just go. Well, it's still uh, one minute shy. Of it. What's that? It's still not quite the right time, right? It's <laughs> something. Eight seconds to go or something. Yeah, yeah, we started at seven, so technically it's, uh, yeah, we got a little time. People will come and go. Yep. Hey, Bill. Hello there. So, Fred. Yeah. I hear they're doing something different with umpires this year. I gather that several of them have gone to the World Series in reserve just as a precaution. Maybe, oh, yeah. as, many, maybe as many as four of them as, I mean, there's the six guys on the field. There was a seventh guy on the crew in the league championship series that was always just back in the locker room, I think, or the umpire's room in case something happened to one of them. But I, I believe there may be as many as four of them at the World Series, just in case. An outbreak could get two or three, I suppose. All of them. Yeah, that's true, because they're in that umpire's room. It's pretty small. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to learn I told, more. Bill, I told Joe that... Um, Dan hadn't gotten back with me, so he's going to do something. <laughs> if anything, he'll send me his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dan, maybe, uh, I don't know if Dan is, I don't know who's on the crew for the World Series or not, do you know? No, I haven't, I haven't looked. Yeah. So maybe he's doing that, or maybe he's selling real estate. <laughs> I, when I, when Joe told me he was short three games, all he had to do was do one of these two series, it would have broke the record. Count postseason. Do they count the postseason games that way? No, but that's that's another record, you know. Oh, yeah. Count. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he needs three more games of anything. Yeah. So the first series next year, he'll break it. Yeah. He he needs three to break, just two to tie. Right. Yeah. Or it might be the other way, three and. Four, yeah, because so otherwise, like, otherwise you want a four-game series. <laughs> yeah, I have to. I have to check. Well, we don't have to worry about that for a while. We we'll hope there is a season next year. I know. It. I hope there is, so I can at least go. Yeah, I mean, I did. I went to a bunch of games this year because I'm just fortunate to be able to get credentials. But it was definitely not the uh, kind of experience that any of us would ever enjoy. I mean, it was almost worse going to the games because. You got intelligent commentary when you're listening to a broadcast, and we're sitting in the press box with nothing going on, and you couldn't walk around the field either. Yeah, they weren't nice. selling food or anything either, right? But they, they, but they were giving it away, so that was oh. nice. Oh, that was, uh, and it was reasonably good food. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you were very restricted as to where you could walk, and uh, just you weren't allowed to take the elevator. Unless you had a handicap. Yeah, Joe said that they just went from the their room to the ballpark. Yeah. And then back. And back, yep. Very wow. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, pretty interesting. I, I hope we are able to have some real baseball next year. You know, yeah. I, I mean, it's it's good listening on the radio because I'm more of a radio guy than a TV guy. Mm -hmm. I always have been. And it just, you know, so you really can't really can't tell what's really missing unless you watch the game on TV, but I, I sure do miss going to the ballpark man, this year. You in, know. Boston, in Boston, the way the telecasters were not there, they worked from a, a, a remote location. The home team, the broadcast team was at Fenway Park for the home games, but they didn't go on the road. Yeah. Right. That's the way it was at the Padres too, mm -hmm. in San Diego. Yeah, that's the way it was at the, in Houston too, so. The Cubs also. Mm -hmm. I see our fearless leader is here, Bob. Hello, sir. Hey. <laughs> hey, Joe, how are you? 
<laughs> better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing fine. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I mean, uh, we are uh, honored to have uh, a... Uh, we're honored to have Bill Nolan here with us today. So um, we're going to go over, I, I thought it would be fun to just like get some, we've had a little uh, conversation to begin with today. So um, um, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, I don't know, some general comments about kind of how the season ended real fast. I mean, it was some real quick comments about how, does, how the season ended and, uh, I'm doing that because I'm going to open a poll question here in a minute, and it kind of directly relates to that. Uh, and when I open the poll question, I want all of you to kind of get involved if you could. So we'll just kind of warm up the crowd, so to speak. You know, I think the poll will. But um, I don't know. What do you think about the way the season ended? Did the team overachieve? I think so because uh, they lost uh, Gary Cole and – uh, Verlander and Osuna and Alvarez and Bregman was out. Those you know, everybody. If you told me they were only missed the World Series by one game, I would have laughed my butt off. You know, mm. no way. Oh man, yeah. Uh, I, I really didn't know what to expect, but then you know, once once the playoffs started, they it's like they it's like a switch went off, <laughs> and they started like, oh, we we've been here before. They, they swept through Minnesota, took care of Oakland. And then when they went down 3-0, I was like, um, okay, well, I guess that gas is out. <laughs> but then they stormed back, and I thought they were going to have that repeat of uh, the Red Sox. Right, Bill? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were all paying attention to it up here in Boston, that's for sure. <laughs> I hope they don't imitate the Red Sox next year. <laughs> no, probably, probably, probably not. So. Okay, um, well, so this is how we're going to um, do it today. We're, we're going to go through, uh, uh, I got a poll here, and then I'm going to introduce our, uh, and our main guest, Bill Nolan from Sabre. We, if we've read any of the uh, material or that's come out in the last, God knows how many years, you've been the editor of how many books. Um, I mean, wow. Uh, but you always, I've worked with Bill on a couple of uh, different, uh, uh, on a project. So um, anyway, it's just, then, then we're, uh, we're going to have a video on spring training from Sam. Uh, if, if, we, if we have time and then, uh, you know, we will uh, go from there. But I, I thought it would be good to just kind of warm everybody up with a poll question. Uh, I did this last month. And, but it was like at the end. So I, I thought I would release it at the beginning here and it should just automatically pop up on your screen. Okay. So I'm kind of curious, there's four questions here and I'm just kind of curious to see some of the answers and we'll kind of, I'll give you all about a minute or so and then we'll just talk about it. So it should just pop up for everybody and everybody should be able to respond. Y'all see that? Yep. Got it. We're going to have the stats, uh, kind of like last month, we'll kind of have the stats uh, uh, go out when we uh, when we send out the recap, and I'll put it in the video, um, and uh, the video information when I upload this to YouTube. So. Believe it or not, um, I tried to give the Astros a little luck. Number one, the question used to say is, will the Astros win the World Series? <laughs> I wrote that, that last week. <laughs> but then I kind of ran out of luck. Because <laughs> Mattress Mac right. didn't offer any beds this year. What's that? Mattress Mac didn't offer any free beds this year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did anybody see the Jeff Luno interview today? This no. Pretty interesting. You have to tell about tell us about it here in a little bit. Well, he, he, 
apparently I was wondering if he was represented by outside counsel. And I think he was because he went up to the uh, commissioner's office loaded with a lot of information and uh, he thought he made a pretty good case, strong case. He hit, didn't know anything about what was going on. And apparently he is saying that it was handled by some of the coaches and some people in the uh, um, television room there at the, uh, at the ballpark. I gather it was only done in Houston and he didn't name anybody any names, but I think uh, it, it must have been Carlos Beltran, he, his name appears everywhere, maybe some of the coaches. Uh, he thought that uh, he was surprised that the ownership let him go so quickly without a fare they well, thought it, it was handled pretty badly. He had intimated that the uh, there was a big ruckus about a lady reporter in the uh, uh, locker room after the they beat the Yankees, I believe, and that she was... Uh, saying, well, are you still glad that you had Osuna? And mm -hmm. one of the PR guys just blew up at that. And uh, Luna was saying that he had to take the heat for it, but actually this was something handled by the PR department, the marketing department, and some of the legal types there at the ball club. He's stayed in touch with Hinch a little bit, and some of the players, he really likes Altuve and Bregman, I think Springer, some of the other guys too, I'm sure Correa as well. And he worked eight years to put the, the team back in shape. There would be some reverberations about it because he basically called into question some of the findings of, of the commissioner of baseball. And he thought that, why did this happen? Well, he, he concedes that there was some cheating going on. I don't know how severe it was. Some cheating going on. They broke the rules. But it was really the Dodgers that wanted their pound of flesh. They really were pushing the commissioner's office very hard to uh, strike hard at the Astros. And uh, he said he didn't want to say anything while the season was going on. And uh, he, he also knew at the time that they were investigating the Red Sox, and maybe the Yankees, maybe some other teams too, for stealing signs, stealing signals. And, and uh, not much has come out of that. So they had to make an example of the Astros. He, he didn't think the club handled it very well as far as he was concerned. So Tony, so Tony, it sounds like uh, you're saying what I've always thought. It was a media hit job. Uh, <laughs> or a baseball hit job. The way it was. The way it was. And, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, Crane's businessman, he cuts his losses pretty quickly. Maybe that's what happened here. But still, uh, Luno had basically uh, taken the club. He said it was a pretty horrible franchise when he joined it. After eight years, it was pretty darn dominant. So it's there will be a, the full interview is available on the channel too. They'll have it on their website. So we're on almost uh, 30 minutes with commercial break. So it's very interesting. He's a very eloquent guy. And what? at the end, he's starting to tear up a little bit. I have a question, uh, Tony, and this is the thing that has puzzled me the whole time. Why the Dodgers? Because every indication is that by the time the world series was played, there was no sign stealing going on. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just so, so, uh, I, and the Dodgers have been, uh, the biggest so-called crybabies, and they weren't using it by the time the world series came on. So that's yeah. why it, uh, it really puzzles me. I, I think maybe they're just used to being a royalty in the major leagues, even though they haven't won a championship in many, many years. Uh, Who's, who do you think they're a dominant club out there because of the fans they draw every year? They're just very prominent in uh, Major League Baseball, specifically out in California and Los Angeles. Who knows? Maybe it's just personality. They just didn't like losing in seven games to the Astros in Dodger Stadium. Um, that's that's all I can all I can think about. It may go a little deeper than that. Yeah. So. All right. Good. Yeah. Interesting stuff, Tony. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, it looks like uh, we had 21 responses, so I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. We had a uh, vote at the last second for the Rays. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rays, uh, yeah. So people think the Rays are going to take it from the Dodgers. Um, kind of curious about number two with uh, Morgan passing away. So, uh, yeah, it, it makes sense. All right. You know. yeah. Anybody surprised with that? Yeah. Uh, did Joe Morgan play second base for us in 1980? Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. I'm surprised with Joe being there because uh, golly, it's, you're ignoring three batting titles and Joe was good here, but he was great with the Reds and he, you know, that's where he made his name. Uh, so I'm a little surprised about that. And what was wrong with Yuli? I thought about having a question, what was wrong with Bregman <laughs> too, but what, what was wrong? 14 people, 67% uh, said something else. So what is that something else? <laughs> well, he was, uh, he's an older guy. He's been playing ball for about 20 or 30 years. <laughs> Who knows? So bat, maybe he's got, got a lot a of baggage on him. <laughs> I think the bat got a little old and slow too, but. Uh, yeah, well, they could be. You know, there was that uh, World Series many years ago where Hodges was hitless in seven games for the Dodgers against the Yankees. Who can explain that? Hey, Joe. Yeah. I think it was interesting uh, this week, Harside Trivia rated the 10 best second baseman ever. Uh huh. Biggio did not make the list, but Joe Morgan had a war of 100.5. And the number two guy was Whitaker at 75. Most of them were in the 60s. But Joe Morgan, as an offensive second baseman, the way they rated it was just – he was like uh, Ruth used to be in the home run race. Before they, everybody what talked. about – Just head and shoulders above everybody else as far as – Mike, did they, uh, did they evaluate players like Hornsby or Charlie Geringer? They were rating second baseman, so no. Uh, Hornsby was a second baseman. Yeah, they got Alomar, Kano, Dorr, Garden, Kinsler, McPhee, Morgan, Pedroia, Randolph, and Whitaker as the top ten. Yeah, those are all <coughs> recent guys. Yeah, they had to be recent, yeah. He's not recent. Well, Garden wasn't either. He had 55.7 more. So. I don't know. I, I was just thinking Astro's second baseman. I don't That's what I thought. Well, Joe Morgan yeah, was an Astro second baseman, and he's the only one in the top ten on this list. That's my yeah, point. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand that. The uh, right, he, right, I guess the point with Joe is he wouldn't have been on that list if he had had the same numbers throughout his career at Houston that he had at Houston. He had yeah. to have that. He had to be with the Reds. Uh, and, but uh, some people just voted him as the best Astro second baseman ever, and total career. I guess you don't maybe complain about that. But uh, as far as uh, just here, I don't. I I wouldn't have ranked in that high. Oh, well, Bill you gotta James. remember what the dome was when Joe played. He yeah. was still drawing 100 walks and a 40 percent on base average. He had three doubles one time off the upper screen in right field, which would all have been home runs ten years later. I mean, the, the ballpark took a lot away from him back then. Mm -hmm. I took away, uh, uh, which is why the Reds traded for him because the the. Cincinnati's field wasn't anything like the Astrodome to hit in when it first opened. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and very quickly, though, uh, Springer's played his last game as an Astro. Yep. They got a fame. I saw somewhere online where, uh, you know, during the uh, Division Series or the Oakland Series, and somebody on Twitter said, this is why you got to pay Springer half a billion dollars. I was like, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna be 32 years old so the only uh legitimate contract as far as i'm concerned would be something like three years plus options but of course he isn't going to accept anything like that because somebody is not going to worry about the fact that in three years he's going to be 35 36 years old is i don't know if anybody saw uh adam wexler's tweet tonight but uh click pretty much uh it was kind of a farewell tweet I don't know if anybody else saw that. I did. I, well, I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. it. It did sound like it. It sounded like you've been a great guy and we love you. And But yeah, he didn't what say we're going to. He, he never even said we're going to do everything we can. He nope, didn't say that. Nothing yeah. to encourage. Nothing no. to encourage keeping him here. No. And I think he probably is tired of, of the uh, controversy surrounding the Astros, too. And he, it may well, don't you, he goes to Boston. That may be something you want to worry about. Don't you think that's going to follow him wherever he goes, though? It yeah, could. I kind of do. Yeah. I don't know. I, don't I know. think they're saving their money for Korea. They like to keep that infield. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Yeah, yeah. And JV, and JV contract is going to be insured for next year if he's out, right? Uh, it surely is, but uh, 
is Tal with us? Tal can tell us about the insurance business, I think, with players' contracts. But uh, you'd think they surely put uh, all of those $33 million a year deals, or all the huge ones, surely right. are insured. Yeah. Uh, the problem with George, I, I think, uh, actually, with losing George is the fact that this, uh, this franchise is kind of short on uh, up and coming potential outfield stars. I mean, Tucker's here and it took him a couple of years before he found his uh, footing. And if there are some down there, I don't know them. And the ideal situation is to part with a, a, a free agent because you also know that you've got somebody that can take over. And I, I don't think they do. Yeah. There might be a lot of one year deals this year. We've got the, first of all, uncertainty about the, uh, the pandemic, but we've also got the, the agreement comes up at the end of next season too. The agreement with the players. One year deals would make a lot of sense for both uh, clubs and players in this uncertain time. I'm, I'm not sure how many of them really want one because they, they are looking for that long-term security, but uh, considering the revenue was way down this year, uh, that may make some clubs reluctant to yep. go crazy as they have in the past. We're just going to have to wait and see how it turns out. Somebody will go crazy. You know that. And it goes without saying, I think for all of us that, the Astros must offer the uh, qualifying offer to both yes. Springer and Bradley. I agree. Totally agree. Uh, they got Bradley offered is, something. Is Bradley a better candidate to stay with us? Well, he signed a what? He just signed a two-year deal uh, here. Yeah. As I recall, that, that just expired. Uh, I, he might be, because George is already making – what, 21 million off his uh, arbitration deal this year. So he's not going to want less than that. And, and he's going to want as many years as he can get to. Uh, and I don't think Brantley probably has quite as much bargaining power. We'll have to see. Yeah. I remember Brantley and Springer are best friends too. That's another issue. They like it, each other. It, it is an issue. And if they, if they want to stay together, here's the only place you can guarantee that because they're not going to likely find a team that's going to be able to sign both of them other than the one they're with. Yeah. If they've got the money to do it. Maybe they can sign them like Koufax Drysdale back in 66. <laughs> yeah, they held they held up they held up the Dodgers. They had to they had to sign them both. Dollars yeah. were different. <laughs> yeah, for about 300,000 a piece. <laughs> yeah. Hey hey Joe, what did you think? I thought Dusty Baker did a terrific job for the Astros. Um yeah, I, I thought I thought he was the right manager considering the situation. Considering the controversy, I mean, you're talking about a guy that had to deal with all that drama around Barry, you know, around Barry Bonds. So uh, kind of used to that kind of thing. So I think he did a great job, you know, um, dealing with Bonds and Kent. So, yeah, yeah I just, I don't know. You know, uh, I, I, had, I, I had a flashback, though, uh, when he had the decision as to whether or not to keep Grinky in the game. Because, as you know, a lot of us thought that last year, Hinch should have let him go at least one more batter. Uh, and that's, of course, second, second guessing because of what happened with the relief corps giving up home runs and runs. But uh, in this case, he did go with stay with him for one more batter. And by golly, it worked out. So uh, I, I had that flashback right away when that happened. And uh, this time it worked. Good. All right. So it looks like this poll thing uh, seems to work. It kind of gets everybody warmed up for, uh, and on that note, I'm going to uh, turn the meeting over to our guest of honor, Bill Nolan. If you've never worked with Bill, or if you don't know Bill, he was, uh, you were vice president in 2004. You served, what, five terms? Something like that as vice president? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. And he writes a ton. He edits a ton. Uh, he wrote a really good book on uh, Tom Yawkey. Um, and, uh, was the umpire, was the Yaki book, the most recent book or was the umpire, or did you write something since then? Uh, the umpire's book is the newest one. Uh, Tom yeah. Yaki was a year or so, two ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I need something else to work on now. <laughs> a, a big project. I, there's a lot of small things I'm doing. I've been writing up a lot of games project things recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Good. Yeah, uh, tell me about it. So, uh, hey, Bill do a book on the Astros. Yeah, hey, get on. Yeah, 
He's it's, always it's looking for ideas. over now. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I think you sent out a, a message not that long ago to uh, Saber people about uh, coming up with new di- new ideas for new series or something like that, or maybe you were. Well, the, there's a, now a thing called the editorial committee, and we sent out a request for ideas for mm-hmm. future books. Uh, the deadline was October 1st, uh, so they're all in by now. We'll have another deadline coming up in April. Twice mm-hmm. a year, we'll court new, new ideas. And I guess in a couple of weeks, uh, I think two weeks from tonight, we're having a meeting to sort through the proposals that have come in. I, th- I understand we had 25 or 30 ideas that came in. So that's pretty uh, impressive. Yeah, yeah. Some of the ideas probably are not going to make it, but, uh, you know. <laughs> it's just it's impressive that that many people came up with that many different ideas and i'm sure there'll be more than enough very good ones yeah yeah most definitely so if any of y'all want to get into uh, uh, any writing stuff with saber uh, bill's the guy to talk to so with that i'm going to turn the meeting over to you bill it's uh okay. it's your party. <laughs> yeah, most most of the stuff that i've done recently has been as you mentioned joe uh editing uh or organizing i kind of like the logistical side of putting these books together. Sabre books are always have 25, 35 contributors. And I just enjoy interacting with all the different people and, and pulling things together. And uh, I can't do all the work myself, was always a fact checker because I'm no good at fact checking. I mean, I, I see things that are wrong occasionally, but I don't have the self-discipline to go as, the, as good fact checkers do and check everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, They'll just say, you know, a right hand, you know, right hander came in and they won't just take the author's word for it. They'll look up and make sure the guy really was right handed. And I just don't have the patience to look up every single thing like that. But very impressed with the work that those guys do. And I never really learned English much in school. So I'm not a good copy editor. Grammar and things like that are kind of goes over my head a little bit. <laughs> but it's it's fun bringing these projects together. And uh, what got me interested in umpires in particular was the Sabre book on umpires and umpiring that came out about three and a half years ago, I think. Uh, I, uh, the whole idea of the first one of the books in this new series came out in December 2011. And it was uh, called Can He Play? It was a book about scouts and scouting. The idea came from Jim Sandoval, who's no longer with us, but he was a a real expert on scouting and a real pleasure to work with. He and I worked on that together. And I I learned an awful lot about scouts that I had not thought about, not known about. And it it was just a a really nice project. And I got hooked on the idea of putting these uh, uh, books together with other people. The... um, Working on the umpire's book sort of followed the scout's book. It was several years later, but it took uh, some time to to put it together. Larry Gerlach, I worked with closely on that one. He was my mentor because he had a lot of experience on previous books uh, that he had done on on umpires. So that was that was a very exciting book to to put together. And I realized in the course of doing it, uh, I had. You can all, if you haven't seen that book, it's free to all Sabre members. You can download it and uh, and get it. Or if you're like me and you like the paper editions, you can get it that way off this, the Sabre website. But we looked at umpires and umpiring from every direction we could possibly uh, imagine. Uh, and one of the treats to me was to actually meet a number of these guys in the course of doing it. Uh, I had met a couple of umpires way back in 2002 we did a program, the first, it was the second Sabre convention I ever went to. We hosted it in Boston and we did a panel on umpires at that, uh, that one. And so that was, that was kind of my first uh, introduction. But really, I think like a lot of people, to me, umpires were these guys in suits that came out of a hole in the ground and were around during the game and sometimes got into exciting arguments and, controversies and they went back into the hole in the ground and they, you didn't think about them again. Uh, even today, there are really only two umpires, I'd say, maybe other people would pick a few more, but it's only a couple of umpires that I think you might recognize if you saw them on the street. It, it still have to be in context to some extent. If you saw, and I'm thinking about Joe West and Angel Hernandez, if you saw one of those two guys 
in uh, standing in line at a you know, McDonald's or someplace, you know, in February, would you recognize them? Well, maybe not. But if you saw them walking on, into a ballpark, you probably would. Most of the other umpires can walk right into a ballpark and nobody even notices that they're there, which is the way they like it. They, they don't like to be the center of controversy. We've had a few umpires in the past that enjoyed being on the stage occasionally. And uh, that that's fine and uh, actually kind of entertaining. Uh, one of the people I talked to in the course of this book later on was, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what her name as it was one of the umpire's wives. And she said that the minute she heard that instant replay was coming, she thought, well, there goes half the fun of baseball games. And that was my first reaction too. that some of those arguments that used to really, uh, it added something to the game, I thought. Uh, they just don't happen as much anymore. Now it's like, mm, put on the headsets and uh, that's it. Uh, so we kind of missed something there a little bit, but uh, I just, uh, there are a couple times at Fenway Park, I just I just approached them. I, I didn't have somebody to introduce me. I knew where the umpire's room was at Fenway Park. I live in Boston. And uh, so I went down and I learned that they get in about an hour and a half before the game typically. So I just kind of waylaid them as they came in. This is back in 2014 when I started working on that, that Sabre book. And uh, I just said, I'd like to ask you some questions about what it's like to be an umpire, uh, what it's like umpiring. Uh, and I was innocent. I didn't know the answers to these questions. I wasn't looking for canned answers of some kind. I, did, I really didn't know. I was curious. I, I was a really shy kid growing up. And the idea that I would approach total strangers and ask them questions about their lives, I think that it's something I learned to do to a considerable degree through Sabre, through writing a lot of the biographies that I that I wrote over the last 20 years or so. But uh, I, I don't know, I got over some of that shyness, I guess. And uh, I thought there'd be resistance. I thought a lot of umpires would have been burned by past experiences, uh, talking to somebody in the media and maybe being misquoted uh, one way or another that they, it would, they would just be reluctant, would hesitant to speak. And that was not the case at all. There were maybe four or five guys. And I, I deliberately don't call out their name because they're welcome to their uh, privacy. Uh, but that th they just didn't want to talk. I think, I can't say why, because I didn't ask them why they didn't want to talk. They didn't want to talk. Uh, I can imagine that they saw nothing to gain by it. Who was I, some stranger that was getting in their way when they wanted to play cards or <laughs> something and relax before the game. Uh, and they just didn't have anything to, to gain from it and, and maybe feared that there'd be something that would come out the wrong way. I did learn that some of the umpires have reasons to be skittish about one subject or another. Vic Carapaza, for instance, his father-in-law is uh, Richie Garcia. And Richie was one of the umpires that was involved in the mass resignation and, you know, he could, if, you, if you're going to be an umpire, you want to make it on your own, not feel like you got the job because of your father-in-law, which certainly wasn't the case. He was an MP in the, in the U.S. military. He, was, he can stand up for himself. Uh, but um, I, I had a sense that that was the reason he was hesitant the first time I talked to him. So the second time I said, listen, let's just talk. And I, I promise I won't ask you a single question about your father-in-law. And that's just off, off topic. And then he was fine. And I didn't ask him a question. I still haven't asked him a question about his father-in-law. You know, he has his reasons to be the way he is. And uh, I respect that. Uh, but I was, I was just really surprised how forthcoming so many of them were. Uh, and it wasn't always the case with the call-up umpires, the guys that are triple A, that are hoping to make the, the majors. That, I completely understand. And it went, several of them said, listen, I'd really rather not. And they didn't have to go any further than that. I just said, no, I understand you. You know, you can't risk being quoted one word wrong and lose your chance at, at making the majors. Put in seven, eight, nine years working your way up from umpire school through the low minors into single A, double A, triple A, then getting called up and 
you just can't take a chance on any single thing going wrong that that might help you uh, eventually reach your goal. I, when we get to questions and answers, ask any number of questions and, and I'll try my best to do from my memory, talk about it. Fred Rogers is on the call now and he certainly knows a lot of these umpires more, more better than I do. And I, I've had mostly just brief conversations uh, with them, maybe a half hour or an hour on, uh, and I kept in touch with some of them and uh, that's good too. But um, inevitably it's, you know, they've got work to do I can't impose them their time uh, too much. I, I usually try to talk, I usually try to approach them like I come in on a Friday night for a weekend series. And I'd say, listen, I know you're, you're busy now. I'll, I'll be here the next couple of days. Maybe we can talk tomorrow night before the game, if you get maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And then there's a couple other guys that, I mean, Tim Timmons, I think three times that he came through Boston and we were gonna talk. And for one reason or another, it didn't happen. He had family that was visiting at, or friends that were at the ballpark and he had to go greet them to get, make sure they got in the park. Okay. So finally he said, listen, just call me on the phone sometime. And so we did the phone conversation and it was kind of interesting because he was, when we did the conversation, he was walking through Manhattan streets. He was on his way from the hotel heading to the replay operations center. And so <laughs> I interviewed him. And I could hear in the background every so often you hear a car honk or something like that. And, uh, and so we had like 20 minutes or so as he was walking to the uh, to do replay. And we've kept in touch since uh, some, but uh, you got to got to get advantage of the time when you can. Um, who is that other guy? Um, Trip Gibson. I think I ran into him four different times at three different parks even. Uh, I, I ran into him at Yankee Stadium once. and I think I ran into him at Petco on another time and uh, finally he and he something you know just this isn't a good time and then finally the last time he came to Fenway Park um, we got a chance to talk and you know these guys have all kinds of different backgrounds I always ask each one of them what do you think you would have done if you hadn't uh, umpired and in his case he would have been probably a high school art teacher that's not really the kind of thing you maybe expect <laughs> hear from an umpire I understood that a lot of them might have law enforcement aspirations or backgrounds. Uh, one of them, Ed Hickox is probably working, unless he's on the World Series crew, he's probably working right now as a sheriff in the Orlando area. I mean, Ormond Beach over by the shore in, uh, in Florida. He's, he works for the sheriff's department in the off seasons. He has a badge, he has a gun. He doesn't bring it onto the field at major league facilities <laughs> but, you know, when he's uh, Working for the police department, he has one. Uh, he's a detective, so he doesn't really have, he's not out patrolling the streets anymore, but he he does, he is issued one. Uh, but uh, yeah, Trip Gibson had, had, he thought he probably would, his degree, his college degree was in printmaking. It was an art degree in printmaking. So he, he figured that, and he had did, done some of that in the off seasons too. He figured that's probably what he would have ended up being. Uh, Dan Bellino, has a law degree. Uh, he's, uh, so does uh, Ted Barrett. He has a degree in theology. And that was, he was one of the first guys I, I talked to. And, uh, you know, I, I read a little bit about be, him beforehand. I knew he'd been a sparring partner of several former heavyweight boxing champions, Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, and two or three other ones. And uh, there's a reason that he was a sparring partner. He was good at it. You, you can't be a sparring partner if you're like me. I mean, what, what, good, what good would I do? They'd like throw one pitch at me and I'd run away. That wouldn't be putting up much of a battle. So he was good enough to, uh, to stay in the ring with him and, uh, but also didn't pull off any cheap shots or anything like that to try to damage them. But he kept, you know, different ones hired him. I don't think you want to mess with him out on the field. But then I found out he was a PhD and it was in theology. And that was like kind of totally astonishing. So he's a, I call him Dr. Barrett because he is, but he's also a Reverend Barrett. And uh, his, I read his dissertation. It was about, uh, because he was in religion, it was centered on faith, but it was about umpires and the, some of the struggles and challenges they face being away from family on the road in hotels much of the year 
And uh, there are, I mean, that's a challenging situation. You don't, you, you don't have a, I mean, you can't, maybe you're friends with a couple other guys on the crew, maybe. Uh, I mean, they all get along okay, I guess. But uh, if you're on a baseball team, you've got 24 other ball players and you've got all the support staff too, the trainers and the sometimes transition translators and various people you can pal around with. You're having a hard time with one guy one day, you just go hang out with somebody else for dinner. Umpires in a very, very small group, four people basically by the time you make the major leagues. And uh, they, uh, it, it, it would not be surprising and isn't surprising that some of them have had issues over time. What's reassuring these days is how much, to me, I, I was impressed with how much Major League Baseball invests in the physical and mental health of these guys. They have a couple of people that work with them just to take care of any, to talk out any issues that they might have. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that there have been people that have been saved is maybe too strong a word, but have, have been helped out from going off some form of deep end one way or another. I mean, Ted's work was all done anonymously with umpires, but some of them challenged with sub, were challenged with substance abuse issues. In the past, I don't think that happens as much anymore because of the counseling they get. And they get good physical uh, medical counseling these days too. Uh, you can tell by looking at umpires even that they, they tend to look a little, uh, I don't know, sturdier maybe than they, they maybe once did. I was just the, the various backgrounds that they all came from. I, several of them uh, had their parents, uh, often a father, were factory workers. Tim Timmons, I mentioned, at Hitchcock's. Uh, Phil Cussey's father was a sheet metal worker. Uh, Les Diaz, he, he came from Cuba at a very young age. His father cut sugar cane before they, uh, before they left Cuba. Um, Gabe Morales, his father, was uh, worked for the San Jose Police Department. His mother was a high school guidance counselor. Uh, one of the reasons that Dan Bellino has a law degree is that his mother worked as a court reporter in federal court in the Chicago area. And he just he was he said he was so impressed by the sharp outfits that so many of the attorneys wore that he had decided when he was something like eight or nine years old that he was going to go to law school. And you know, I said, that, how, how do you ever even conceive of the notion of going to law school when you're like 10 or 11, 12 years old? And he just said that was it. He saw, he saw this kind of uh, life around the courthouse and it just impressed him. Uh, he didn't work his first game till he was 23 years old though. These guys, some of these guys started when they were 10, 12 umpiring little league games. And some of them didn't start till, till much later. Mike Estabrook said he was drafted, uh, so to speak. He didn't use that word. I, I used that word, but he was, uh, he was maybe 12 years old or something. And they, the umpire didn't show up for a game. A couple of umpires didn't show up for a, maybe it was a weekend tournament or something like that. And he was told that he had to go umpire. And he said, no way. I'm, you know, I, I refused to do it. And then they told him, well, you get paid $20. And he said, oh, okay, okay, I'll do it. And uh, that uh, convinced him to become a professional. Uh, so uh, some of these professional umpires were getting two or three dollars a day in their very earliest days. Some of the guys that are now maybe uh, in their 50s and 60s uh, were, I mean, when they started out, they just weren't getting paid that much. A uh, couple of uh, Doug Edding's mother was uh, on the board of Little League in the area that he grew up in. She assigned him <laughs> to do a game once they were short on umpires once. And again, he said he didn't want to do it, but then he found he got, you know, he got paid and, and he kind of enjoyed it uh, as, you know, if you didn't enjoy it, you wouldn't keep doing it. But uh, the, uh, I don't know, it's, it's very, some of them had relatives in the game, as we know, uh, people like Brian Gorman, his father was a, a ball player, and uh, Tom Gorman, and, uh, the Wendelstedts, Harry Wendelstedt was an umpire before Hunter came along. Uh, Mike DeMuro, his father was Lou DeMuro, a former umpire himself. And then we've got, we've had, I, I guess they're both retired now, but uh, Tim Welke and, and Bill Welke were, were brothers. Uh, quite some years apart, as I recall, they were something like more than 10 years apart, but they, uh, they were brothers that both went in and made it all the way 
to become a major league umpire, which is really, a, it's, it's really a, a struggle that they all would remember a time in umpire school where they came in and they, some of us may have had a similar experience at one form of uh, organization or another when they say, look to your left, look to your right, you know, a year from now, only one of the three of you is going to be still doing this. And you know, they say at umpire school, they say, look in this classroom, only one or two of you is ever going to become a major league umpire. And uh, I can't remember who it was right now, but one of them was said they went through the class alphabetically and they were each calling out the name, you know, in introducing themselves. And so one guy would say, hi, my name is, uh, you know, Ted Robinson, and, you know, my name is uh, Arthur Swanson or whatever. And he's listening to that. And all of a sudden, one guy says, well, my name's Hunter Wendelstedt. And he says, uh-oh, well, if that's the one guy that's going to make it. I, I guess I don't have a chance. But I guess apparently that one year, three of them made it. And so uh, it was a unique year in some regards. Um, I found it interesting. I, I kept trying to think of different kind of questions to ask. And one of the questions I asked kind of near the end was about what their favorite position was. Most people said their favorite position was working the plate because every single pitch, you know, you're, you have to make a call on every single pitch. Unless the guy hits the ball someplace, you don't have to make a call on that one. But you have to be ready for every single pitch. You have to be ready to make a call on every single pitch. A couple of guys said that because of the rotation works, if you at first base, one game, you're usually at home plate the next game, third base, the game after that, and then second base. So a couple of them said they like third base best because after the intense day of working the plate, it was like the closest thing to a day off. There is less action at third base typically than any of the other bases. And uh, just after the intensity of working the plate, it's something of a day off. A couple of them said they like second base because of the range of motion, because you know home plate, every other place you're pretty much fixed. You've got to stand there Was second base umpire has to move around a lot. Got a right-handed batter, a left-handed batter, people on base and so forth. You've got to shift your position uh, given the circumstances because you don't want to be in the, you know, batters disrupting his line of vision uh, in any way. The first thing that impressed me, and maybe I should just sort of end here, I guess, and then go to questions and answers because people have a lot of those, I'm sure. Um, the first thing that impressed me was how dedicated so many of these people were. I mean, everybody has a job. A lot of people have jobs they don't like. A lot of people have jobs they just try to get by at. Uh, but you can't make it to be a major league umpire and pass through eight years, typically, of being graded every single game. They get a grade as to how well they did in terms of making calls, but also things like hustle, whether they were in the right position. Uh, and uh, to have them, I mean, several of them said that, you know, an hour after the game, if I'd asked them what the score was, they couldn't tell me what the score was. They didn't know, they couldn't remember it was six to four Brewers or, or whatever it was. They know who, typically know which team won because that has something to do with whether you work the bottom of the ninth inning or not, uh, or it go into extra innings. But, uh, the, you know, and as we all know, there are occasions where people, there'd be a no hitter going on in the seventh or eighth inning and people didn't even know that. But the, uh, the thing that stuck with them was what the name of the book came to after. Tony Randazzo sort of gave the, the book a name. It's called Working a Perfect Game. And I said, well, okay, yeah, it's exciting to work a perfect game, sure. But how many ever, people ever get a chance to do that? Maybe a no hitter or something. And he said, no, 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 that's not what I mean. And he explained that a perfect game for him was a game in which there were no controversies of any kind. All the calls were deemed correct. And the umpires working the game felt that they were correct. And what I mean by that is that sometimes there'd be a call that they would lose sleep over. You know, an hour, a couple of hours after the game, if they're maybe going to sleep. Some of them told me they would lose sleep over a call that was even the correct call but they knew they were maybe four or five feet off where they should have ideally been to make the call. Maybe they lucked out and the angle worked out so that they could see the play at maybe at call at first base, let's say. 
And they made the right call. Nobody challenged it. It was the correct call. They went back and looked at it on replay, uh, on, on video afterwards, maybe. And uh, they knew they made the right call, but they, they, it was self-criticism. They critiqued themselves for not being in the right place. And they do get graded on that kind of, kind of uh, as I said, positioning. But the, some of the strongest critics are them themselves. And that's despite being in the major leagues where you really have tenure. Uh, when you, by the time you're in the major leagues, you're, you're fairly well protected. You wouldn't get there if you weren't always getting scoring 96 and better on all your grades as you get. Everybody has a bad game once in a while, but the, the typical score is in the high 90s. Uh, and uh, you wouldn't, there are guys that drop out along the way uh, that we don't hear about them because they have dropped out at double A or they've even dropped out at triple A. But by the time they make the major leagues, they're, they've, uh, they're good. <laughs> and, uh, and they have a degree of tenure and protection uh, as well. They don't have to worry about, you know, every day that they put one bad call, they're going to suddenly get bounced. Um, that was not just PR. I, I mean, I could tell I talked to enough guys and talked enough to them about it that they weren't just saying that because they thought it would read well to, to tell me how concerned they were. I mean, yes, they talk about integrity of the game and that's good PR talk and all that. But most of these guys, I, I can't say that there's more than maybe one or two of them where I doubted that they were, yeah, yeah I just believed them. There's one guy that told me it's a job. I, I do it because it's a job. And he was, he was frank about that, but he's, he's, you know, he didn't get to be a major league umpire by doing a bad job. He got, got to be one by doing a very, very good job and stay with it. Um, I get to see a question that came in on the chat from which anybody can put one there or, or you could start speaking up. Uh, Bill Brown says, what did the umpires say about working conditions in the minor leagues and what improvements need to be made? There have been a lot of improvements, I gather, uh, over time. It's, it's still a tremendous transition from minor league to even triple A to the major leagues. I mean, the uh, pay scale goes up multiple times. I mean, you work one major league game, you're making as much as maybe <laughs> a couple of weeks of working in the, the minor leagues. I think the minor league umpires make 15 to $20,000 a year and major league umpires, the starting pay is someplace in 150,000 or higher. And they do get up to, to making $400,000 a year, still not as high as the minimum wage for a major league baseball player, but it's still pretty good, uh, good pay. And uh, it can be a good job there, but the, the working conditions, I mean, they typically have to share transportation. Uh, now, I guess in the last few years, some of that has been picked up by uh, where they can charge that back. But before it was, it was on them. I hung out at McCoy uh, where the Pawtucket Red Sox played through this year. Well, they didn't play this year, but the, the park is no longer going to exist after uh, they're not going to be any more minor league games there because the Pawtucket Red Sox are moving to Worcester for next year. But uh, boy, they, um, I saw the meals that they got served at the, uh, there. I mean, it's just styrofoam. This is AAA. And one, le one level below the uh, major leagues. And they, they just, a guy brought in some styrofoam packages with, uh, you know, stuff inside them. It, it, it's pretty basic. You take it, it's food. Uh, I'm sure the food was good enough, but uh, it, it, it's not really any kind of, uh, it's a big deal when you, when you get a chance to work as a call-up umpire, they get paid my, the major league scale. So to be, to get a call, okay, we need you to fill in because so-and-so had a concussion and we need you to get to Chicago right away, uh, be there tomorrow for the game. I mean, that's a tremendous boost for these guys that are, are sacrificing, really. They really are sacrificing, even up through AAA to be working at that, uh, at that level. Um, I think the conditions have improved considerably. I, hear, I mean, I'd heard that one umpire was robbed at gunpoint in a motel that he was staying at. And so now they have a rule that you either stay on the second floor or you stay at an inside where the only access is from inside the hotel, not right from the parking lot to try to prevent that thing from kind of uh, happening because uh, it happened once. 
and maybe uh, some concern that it would happen before that. I mentioned the mass walkout. Bob uh, McCann asked about that. Uh, it was uh, about 20 years ago. I, I now for some I didn't 1999. Never, was it 99? Yeah. Okay. They uh, they uh, were looking for an improvement in their conditions, and they thought that the best approach would be to uh, essentially go on strike. Uh, so and the, if they resigned, that Major League Baseball would be forced to bring them back again, at least come to the table in a way that they hadn't up to that point. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Major League Baseball accepted their resignations. A few of them, I can't remember, it's about 22 of them who stayed out, I think. A few 22. Of them, yeah, a few of them came back. Um, Seven got their jobs back. Because they had to. I mean, it, and uh, but some of, the, some of the other ones, I mean, one guy... I think it was, uh, I think it was Ed Hickox. I think he said it was his first year right. and he was, had only been up for a month or two and all of a sudden they all resigned. Then his father was a union man his, uh, and yeah, he Joe was gonna West go lost and, his job for a while. Pardon? Joe West was out mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah, Tom Hallion is another one that uh, was out. Uh, se several of them came back. I mean, they, uh, I mean, Ed told me he was out and he, you know, he was doing this work as a sheriff and uh, so forth, but he realized, you know, I was a pretty good umpire. Uh, I think I'm going to ask if I can possibly come back again. Phil Cuzzy, same thing. He was, uh, he uh, managed to wangle a meeting with uh, Len Coleman, the president of the National League, and Coleman was impressed with his determination and dedication to come back again. He said, okay, you I can help you come back, but you're going to have to work your way up from the bottom. Uh, you're going to have to, he'd already gone to umpire school three times. I mean, this guy was really determined. Uh, and uh, so he, he did, he, he worked his way back up again. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty impressive what, uh, how several of those guys came back and then some of them just lost their jobs forever and uh, it didn't come back again. Um, Greg asked how do umps feel about all the talk of ball and strike calling being taken over by computers or, or robo umps uh, in the future? Uh, I can imagine that most of them don't really like it. I, I think most of them didn't really like the idea of instant replay when it was first broached to them, but I think now most of them appreciate it. I think it certainly saved some bad situations. I think most of us probably remember Jim Joyce's call where he deprived Andres Galarraga of a perfect game for a call that he knew instantly that he got wrong. Two outs in the ninth inning and a call at first base. Uh, he called the runner safe. He knew within one minute of looking at when he got back into the umpire's room uh, that he made the wrong call and a, a kid for the rest of his life will not have the perfect game. I, I thought that the commissioner should have interceded on that one and just declared that it, to be what we all saw it was, an out. Uh, it wouldn't have hurt anybody, but that's not the way it worked. But I think most of them now appreciate replay and appreciate that getting the call right is the most important thing. And it also takes a lot of that pressure off. I mean, it was a, very impressive that... Um, Jim and Andres Galarraga got together and they wrote a book together called Nobody is Perfect. Uh, and I, th I thought that was a, uh, a wonderful thing that they could become friendly enough and work together and teach us all a, a life lesson of one kind or another out of a situation that was just unfortunate all the way around. But calling balls and strikes, I don't know. I mean, you'd think the technology would be there now we can put a guy on the moon who could do that 40 years ago. Uh, but 3D strike zone, how hard that could that possibly be? Uh, and getting it right is probably a good thing. I, I don't know. I think uh, looking at the age of the people that I saw online here, many of them are somewhere aged <laughs> to me or uh, getting up there. Uh, I think those of us that like baseball at whatever age, I, I think there's something about the human aspect of the game that we all like. I'd rather see a few bad calls and a few calls that we could argue about. Or, or you know, it's just, it's just, it would be too sterile to me, but 
I mean, umpires will do what they're told. They're working for uh, baseball and they do ultimately want to get the calls right. They don't, they're not holding out to be able to make a bad call. I mean, that, that's certainly not the, uh, not the uh, goal that anybody would ever have. Uh, and I do believe that most of them seriously care about a game that they learned to respect from their very first days in umpire school. I, I did get a chance to go down and visit Hunter Wendelstedt, invited me down to the, his, the Harry Wendelstedt School of Umpiring. I went down in the January 2018, I think it was, for three days. I didn't do the whole course or anything, but just to visit. And they, they had field work and then they had classroom work. And in one of the classrooms, I was interested in what they were teaching in the classroom. And at one point, they it wasn't quite a break, but they changed things up a little bit. And they said, okay, we're gonna have a quiz now. And we're gonna show you some photographs of old umpires. And we want you to just write down a piece of paper who they were. And so they showed all these umpires like from the forties and fifties, maybe into the early sixties or so forth photographs of umpires standing around on the field one at a time and you were supposed to write down what their name was and I'm thinking to myself this is kind of a stupid what's the point of this who, who's going to know who these people are what why waste time doing this and so I asked them later why did you do that and they said we wanted to teach respect for the profession and I said well how does it teach respect when you show guys that maybe they don't know who they were of course by that time I knew the answer is because most people got in the 80s on that quiz. Most of them did know who these guys were, most of them. Uh, and uh, these, it wasn't like, they had maybe 20 different umpires they showed. It wasn't just the top two or three. I, I was just impressed. They had studied the past of their profession enough to be able to identify these umpires who, who had preceded them in the game. And that kind of instruction, when you're coming along as a uh, student of umpiring, I mean, that's one of the reasons I believe they, they do believe in the integrity of the game and they, and they understand their role in the future of the game, uh, the past that they came out from and then, uh, you know, the future that comes before us. Well, let me look at the questions here as some information for you there. Uh, you can see a list of all the umpires uh, that were all involved in that mass resignation. Thanks to, to Roland. Um, I enjoyed the flamboyant strike calls by umpires in the past, but don't see any today. Did you talk to any of the fancy strike callers and are today's umps discouraged from one-upping the players? Tom Hallion still got a pretty dramatic yeah. uh, strike call there. He, I mean, he, and he talked about that. He, he developed that on purpose. He, he wanted a kind of a signature motion. And so he goes through this uh, routine. Uh, it, it's just fun to watch him. And a lot of the other guys are copying him. Uh, I think that the they don't seem to be discouraged from that. I, I think it adds just a little flavor, uh, extra, like, I mean, some people get all upset at the bat flip and so forth. Personally, I don't. But then again, I never got upset by players banging on trash cans. I, I thought if, he, <laughs> if the opposition is so stupid, that they're going to have their signs stolen by the other team. That's their fault. Uh, anyway, we won't get into that. <laughs> I know it's a lot of people from Houston here, but the uh, it's uh, I don't know. I think that having the, some of those calls is uh, is kind of interesting, uh, and uh, I think that they I I don't think that they worry about one upping the players. I think they all understand they're in the entertainment business to some degree or another, and I think it helps uh, helps make the game a little more. Interesting. One of the latter guys I spoke to was Rob Drake. <laughs> one thing about Rob that interested me was how he enjoys a couple of times talking to fans. Off, uh, like, say he's working third base and there's a pitching change or something. He might go over and chat with a fan for just a moment while killing time. And uh, I asked them, I know, you know most umpires don't do that. And, but he said he just enjoys doing that from some time. And he, he says he kind of does it a little bit deliberately to humanize umpires. So I think they're mostly female. Well, that could be. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think to ask him that. That must be something. Uh, but in any event, uh, he, uh, I thought that was a good thing. And I asked a couple of other umpires about that, too. Why don't you do a little more of that? I said, uh, 
good thing to let people in the stands, you know, know that you're somebody that you can speak to. You're not just blue or this, you know, intimidating uh, guy out there of some kind or other. And they said they were a little, they're kind of a little discouraged from doing that. It's not something that is promoted. I don't think he's ever gotten in trouble for doing it, but I, I, I mean, I think it's a good thing. It up, you don't want to go hang out and sit in their seats or something like that. But um, just chatting, a, just a friendly couple gestures here and there. You know, every once in a while, I see somebody flip a ball into the stands or something like that. Just any kind of little interaction like that. I mean, I think is good. Not everybody goes to as many games as some of us may be lucky enough to go to. You might be going to one game a year and to have just any kind of interaction with anybody that it provides a memorable moment that you can carry with you. I mean, I, I think that's a good thing. My seats are on third base and Joe West will come over quite a bit and give a kid a ball or something. Yeah. When yeah. he's at third base, he's, he's pretty yeah. nice about that. Yeah, yeah. But Mike, but Mike, what happens with Joe is they used to yell at him. Hey, West, Hey, Joe, he, he never looks, you know, and then finally he keep, they keep hawking at him and he finally turns and looks at him and then they go, you suck. Oh yeah, well. <laughs> so he yeah, he got he got mad at some guys by me during the World Series, kids. Mm. Oh, because of the Altuve call? No, he actually spoke at our Saber meeting and told us that was a good call oh, after the know. review. And I, he's a guest. I didn't want to argue with him, but I thought that was a <laughs> terrible call. <laughs> Ma Maxwell asked, did, did many umpires discuss what pressures there were to improve the health of their lifestyles after John McSherry passed away on the field? Uh, I had mentioned earlier on uh, that they do have met a medical staff. I think that the, it's not so much that, I think a lot of the pressure is not Major League Baseball telling them to get in better shape. I think it's self-awareness and maybe to some extent pure unspoken peer pressure. I mean, you see other guys around you trying to maintain a healthier lifestyle, you may too. Uh, and uh, I mean, they, I talked to Mark Latondre, he, he just retired over this last off season, but he was, uh, he was out in Arizona. He comes from the state of Maine, but um, his, his job was the chief medical, I can't remember the exact title, but he was the medical director of the umpiring staff. And anytime any umpire would get struck by a ball off the mask or something, you know, he'd be on the phone with him or one of his assistants. Cause they've got about, I think six people on the medical staff uh, that are dedicated to umpires. Uh, and they'll ask them, uh, you know, the, if, if it's a significant enough one, the trainer from one of the two teams will, will evaluate them right on the spot. And you occasionally see a, a guy leave a game and, and move around. Uh, I mean, if one guy has to leave, they'll work a three-man crew for the, the rest of the game. But, um, yeah, I think that a lot of it is, they, there is a, there are, there's a place they can go during the offseason, a specific a trainer down in New Orleans that specializes in working with uh, umpires. They have uh, various ways they can consult with people about diet and exercise and uh, talking about their choice of accommodations, some of them would say that, I mean, they, they tend to say at chain hotels because they can build up frequent traveler points uh, and uh, therefore have a chance to, uh, you know, take advantage of that type of stuff. But, you know, a couple of them said, well, we always stay at Hyatt's because they, they tend to have swimming pools and that gives us a, or they have a better exercise room. I mean, that was a consideration. It wasn't just a frequent traveler program. It wasn't just the proximity to the to the ballpark, but it was the a way that they could help stay in better shape. Uh, that that was a, a consideration. Uh, I think, you know, as I said before a little bit, I think visually you can see that most umpires are in, in, in better physical shape than some of the umpires that we maybe remember from uh, days gone by. Uh, Bob asked if there's ever been a female umpire at the major league level, or if not, are any progressing up from the minors? Well, there certainly has not been one at the uh, major league level in the United States. There has been in Cuba. And if you happen to see the, uh, the Sabre book on umpires and umpiring, we did a, an interview with Yannick Moreno, who is, has been for many years now at the Cuban national uh, level, the equivalent of Major League Baseball in, in Cuba. But it's, 
even, but she was extremely rare. There have been several that have made it up to a point, but I mean, Jackie Robinson had problems of his own trying to make it uh, as a person of color in the major leagues and trying to make it as a female umpire is uh, similar kinds of situations. Yeah. Uh, pardon? Somebody, somebody have something to say there? No. Oh, okay. No. It has, it's, there is, a, I think now one umpire that there's a couple in Canada in Canadian baseball that are coming on coming along. And I think there's one umpire that's begun to work in AAA. Am I right about that? Or is it still double A? I know that Larry Young, who works for MLB in New York and is one of the top supervisors, he would very, very much like to see a woman come along and, and break that uh, barrier. Uh, so there would be some degree of encouragement, but you know, there's not going to be the kind of encouragement that's going to uh, bring up unqualified people. That's for sure, that given the grading that everybody goes to. So you've got to have to be very good, and you're going to have to be very determined to to stick with it, and uh, and make your way up there. And uh, it's at this point, just looking at, and there's a bunch of guys that may retire in the next few years because they're guys that came in at the time of that '99 mass resignation. So they've all got 20 years in uh, now. And so there, there are probably going to be an increasing number of retirements. But even with that, I think there were five or six guys that, that retired just over this off season. But even at that, um, the, the opening is, it's going to be several more years, I think, uh, before there's even a shot at that happening. But I, I think it'd be very nice to see it, it happen uh, someday. And I uh, hope I get to see it. Hey, uh, Any questions? Well, Verbal yeah, questions. I had a question. Uh, I read somewhere uh, that they call Ted Barrett um, Reverend Dr. Crew Chief. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there any his, other historical funny nicknames? Because they these sound like a these umpires sounds like a close knit group or something that players call umpires. Is there any famous names like Reverend Dr. Crew Chief? <laughs> well, that's pretty good. Yeah. They probably actually call him Ted most of the time, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I can imagine that, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I I didn't hear too much about that. Fred, you may know some, yeah. some inner, uh, they, they um, may they call each other names that we don't want to, they don't want to know about. Uh, there's, there's a couple of them. They got nicknames for me that I can't even <laughs> say. Okay. Well, I just thought that was funny. I read that and I was wondering if, you know, there's some nicknames out there for these umpires. I don't know. Well, that's when I was asking him. That was in the Saber book. Uh, it was the title of one of the chapters. Was, I was asking him uh, about his his being a, a minister and a, and a PhD. And so I, I don't know how much, many times anybody ever really called him that. But <laughs> couldn't, uh, couldn't Doug Harvey, though, have him beat? Wasn't he just God? He was God, yeah. Yeah, he was God. So uh, that's better than the Reverend Mister Whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> little G, little G. So hard to top that. Yeah. Hey, Bill, didn't uh, Harry Barber umpire a major league game in spring training? I don't know. It's spring, maybe. Who? Perry, Perry Barber. Barber. She's a Saber member that's at all of our conventions. I think. Well, I know Pam Postuma did in spring training. Yeah, she's the one that made it the furthest. I think. Right. Uh, Maxwell said that he spoke to Jean Ardell at one of the Sabre conventions about female umpires, and she doesn't see any, any impediment. There isn't one. Uh, and as I said, Larry Young would like to see this, this happen, but uh, it's just going to be somebody that's got the uh, determination, the perseverance, and to push through what is inevitably going to be some obstacles. I mean, you know that there's going to be people, some players are going to give you a hard time. I mean, I Talk to, uh, I mean, it hasn't been, what's it been 25 years from now since we've had female reporters able to go into the locker room and interview players after games. Some of them had a really hard time at, at first. Uh, and, you know, players would just do obnoxious things uh, to discourage them. Uh, some people want to resist change and, uh, and just want to keep things the way they are, keep a separate club or some kind of another. 
I mean, there'd have to be accommodations made because right now the, uh, the umpire's room, I mean, they just all changed and shower in the same room. So they'd have to put up a curtain, but they've done that in a couple of the other facilities that where people have worked at double A level and so forth. And you, you know, you just make accommodations when you need to. So there, there's definitely no impediment. As long as you can see and uh, see it, see in three dimensions and make judgments and be willing to stand by your, your call, stand up for yourself. Hey, Fred, give us an update on Joe West, a number of games umpired. Will he umpire in the World Series uh, starting tomorrow or? No, he's not. A, they got rid of him. He said there was like 45 umpires better than me, he found out. So because okay. they didn't let him go past the first, first series. But he needs, uh, I can't remember the exact number, 25 or 26 next year for regular season games to break the record. But he only needs three to break the record for most games umpired, including postseason games. Yes, so if he had just done one more series, he would have broke it this year. Ask somebody. Well, don't go away. Just ask him, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Hello. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, Bill, changing yep. gears, we go back a number of years, Dick Biley here. Oh, from, yes, hi. To the Ted Williams Museum. It's getting yep. to be, everything is getting to be a long time ago. Now, and all these umpires, I was thinking the day we met uh, Joe West when he came to our Sabre meeting in Clearwater, I'm, I mean, in uh, Houston, that I'm the only guy probably in the room and maybe on this call that saw Bill Clem and Joe West both umpire. Wow. wow. That's probably true. In 1941, it's given away part of my age at a, actually a Chicago White Sox at Comiskey Park. He umpired a double header against the Yankees. So both thought, home plate too, I bet. Yes, he did. <laughs> anyway. Bill, those things at the Ted Williams thing, going back to those, those were terrific events. I know you they were. were. And one of the things that from that I remember from way back then is and was that Ted Williams never got ejected from a major league baseball game. Wow. He's a guy that had a reputation for making certain rude gestures to sports writers or to fans. He threw his bat a few times and actually one time threw it into the stands, it bounced into the stands and hit Joe Cronin's housekeeper. Well, fortunately, not just some other person, so she didn't sue him. But he, he, he was tempestuous Ted, terrible Ted, he could, a couple of nicknames like that. But he never chewed out an umpire. If he had something to say, he just said it to the ground instead of gesticulating and like that. And uh, I mean, Yogi Berra, when there was this famous anecdote about how Yogi Berra uh, complained to an umpire once. He said that was a strike when Williams was batting. And the umpire said, if Mr. Williams did not swing at it, it was not a strike. <laughs> he developed a reputation for the strike zone. And it didn't come out of no place. I mean, you don't, you don't get any calls as a rookie. But he set what I believe is still a major league record. He, Ted Williams walked 109 times in his rookie year. That's a lot of walks. Yeah. He knew it because he knew the strike zone and he was refused to swing at bad pitches. So he developed, the umpires knew that he knew the strike zone and he, he developed a reputation, probably earned himself a couple of calls, just, you know, uh, just happened, but somehow he didn't swing. So it wasn't a strike. <laughs> and, uh, but he never, uh, he never got thrown out of a game. And uh, a couple of umpires said, uh, one guy told me, uh, uh, this is way back, in the 90s when I was doing the Ted Williams book, um, one of them told me that Ted Williams was the only guy that the last game of the year, he would come to the umpire's room after the final game, sit down with him and say, thanks for, um, thanks for your work this year. Thanks for being associated with the game. Uh, I mean, you know, players are usually off on their own doing something altogether different. And he, he took a moment to just go in and say thanks to the umpires. And apparently he had a reputation in spring training sometimes when he wanted to get away from the adulation of the fans or the sports writers that wanted to ask him a bunch of questions or 
whatever, he would often go out and hang out with the umpires. And one or two of the guys I talked to in this book said he remembered uh, Ted Williams coming in and he'd, he'd come into the umpire's room, bring a couple, some sandwiches and some Cokes or something like that and just talk to them about the game of baseball as a way of just killing some time for himself um, and uh, enjoy speaking to other people involved with the game who were not, they were from another world. They, they weren't going to be bothering him. <laughs> and so he, he developed some, probably wasn't a bad tactic if you want to think of it that way, but I don't think it was really a tactic. I think he just enjoyed uh, their company. He was always friendly with policemen and other people that were not the, uh, you know, the fancy crowd. Dick, you, you work in insurance, is that correct? That's right. Pardon? The New York Yankees still yeah. do. Oh, okay, right. somebody asked a question early on. I don't know if you were on the call, but somebody asked a question early on about insurance on these big contracts when somebody gets a contract for $300 million and so forth. Do the, uh, do the club, are the clubs able to get decent insurance or is that just too expensive? Do you know the answer to that? Well, yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean, <why? laughs> um, the Yankees have always been a, a big buyer of it, uh, primarily, you know, on the whole high profile players. Uh, and it's really a benefit. It's protect the investment that the uh, team, be it the Yankees or the Astros or whoever, uh, have in the contract. And it is expensive, very expensive. And they've, and obviously there's some cases. Uh, I think the Abbott example, uh, played for Cleveland and Baltimore, as I recall, it, it, it cost them a lot of money to over the years on him. And I don't really know how these teams or the insurance carrier, it's all out of London paper with an American company, the Hartford fronting it and how they make any money on it. Because when there is a claim, it's a big one. Well, I mean, if you've got Garrett Cole making $324 million or something like that, and anything can happen any day to prevent him from ever earning any of that, I mean, he's got one season under his sort of, if you call this a season uh, now, but I mean, do they in, just insure a portion of that or do, you can, I mean? Well, it usually comes first off with a, a long elimination period like 60 hmm. days before you're going to collect any money. And then, yes, it is a percentage of the total amount due for that given year. Yes. So if you're making $30 million a year, will, they, will, it, they, will some of them spend as much as $3 million on a policy for one year? Or $1 million? Well, more than that. Go into oh. numbers because I know what they are. Yeah, okay. Well, well it's kind I mean, of. You're not asking good. for specific people, but so they, a, an average ball club is spending many millions of dollars in insurance each year. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, and the bulk of it, frankly, where it's spent thinking about it, probably is for the Yankees in particular, probably the bulk of their money is spent on that. Uh, the disability insurance on players mm -hmm. more than pretty well anything else. Yeah. It's a big ticket item. Right. Uh, and mo I'm sure the Dodgers spend a lot of money on it because they've got a lot of high profile players, but there are teams probably that don't spend anything, maybe like Kansas city on that item or even the Rays. They, I don't, I'm not sure they spend any money. But being familiar with the Yankees, when George Steinbrenner was alive, he was uh, really spent a lot more then than they do now on player disability insurance. And of course, life insurance is a ticket too, but it's nowhere near as expensive as the disability insurance. Yeah, we, I mean, there are rather few instances of active major league players dying. So that wouldn't be a in as much of a situation. 
Yeah, Bill, Tal's on the line. You might ask Tal Smith what uh, Astros have spent in his career on insurance. I, mean, I was just trying to get an idea. I mean, it's 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 not really, I mean, it's sort of none of our business in some regards, although I suppose some of it is public information too. But. Well, this is Tal. Uh, it stands an answer to that, obviously. It, it varies from club to club, and certainly it's changed a lot o over the years. And I've, you know, it's it's been some time uh, uh, since I was in that uh, in in that position to make those judgments. Uh, my, uh, I guess to summarize, it's very difficult to collect. There are so many exclusions. Mm -hmm. You've got a time exclusion, as 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 Dick pointed out, uh, and and that's going to vary. Uh, the nature of the injury, what it does to the player. I mean, the big risk for for uh, Stanford clubs is for uh, is for a guy that used to pitch uh, 200 innings and now he pitches 100 innings for one reason or the other, or a guy that used to hit 285 with 35 home runs and now he's a 220 hitter. You can't insure against those things. You can only only basically insure uh, stands against against complete disability, and that uh, that you know that that means a player has to clearly be inactive, unable to play as a result of whatever it was you're insuring, and generally you're you know it's a, it's a, it's a certain thing you're insuring uh, stands a pitcher against an arm injury. You're not necessarily insuring him against a broken ankle. Right. Uh, so these, it, it, it stands, it's very, it, it varies. It's very expensive. And in my judgment, it's very difficult to collect on. There's very few that pay off. Let me ask, let me ask you about that if I can, Tal, because, you know, I wrote that Biggio Bagwell book and you had that circumstance with Bagwell at the end of his career. He had to be declared as I wrote it, as I was told, uh, he had to be on the disabled list all season, and then he could re then he could actually retire at the end of the season. But he could not play in that right. twenty that that last year. And right. as right. it turned as it turned out, uh, the club did get fifteen point six million dollars of the seventeen million dollar contract eventually paid by insurance. The reason I ask that because wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, Vander uh, 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 <laughs> quickly. Yeah, Verlander. 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 See how quickly we forget. Wouldn't he be in the same boat? Because he's out all next year. And if they put him on the disabled list, then should they not be able to get a large portion it, of that contract? It, it, it depends on the way the policy is written. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it stands perhaps. Perhaps it's written so it'll pay off if he misses a complete year. Uh, since that's the uh, end of the contract, uh, I, I, I suspect that is probably likely in that case, if, if his contract was not expiring and went into, uh, into 2022 and he came back and pitched then, uh, you wouldn't be able to collect. I, I'm not, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure it's really going to pay for Tommy John. I think it'll pay for a complete, for complete, uh, complete disablement that ends a player's career. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 not, it's not going to protect against, against a decline in performance or limited performance or limited availability. Well, let me interject a few things there since you've opened up some doors. Um, it does pay for Tommy John surgery. Now, to, to get into a few incidents that were kind of humorous, when years back when we were doing uh, Mariano Rivera, and I was in communication with this underwriter, he was, his big concern was that Mariano, because he had some wear and tear, you know, on his shoulder, this was after he'd been in the big leagues, maybe seven or eight years, that uh, if he ever became a starter, that it would become a problem. So in the policy, we put a provision that if he ever started consecutive games, the policy would be void. <laughs> started another guy. Started if he started five consecutive games, the policy, I knew it was never going to happen. So what's the difference? Put it in there. 
you know, that was my idea, and he bought it. Parents now, a pitcher by the name of Kevin Brown. Yeah. He did really not want to play anymore after he was traded to the Yankees. And we did have a disability policy on him, and he was trying his best not to play again. And he got a chiropractor in somewhere in Colorado to write this letter that if he ever pitched again and injured his back again, he may become his bingo. And that's why when he retired and the policy did pay off to a degree, but like Tal said, not as much because it was a percentage of what the Yankees had him insured with. So it was a, a lot of negotiation to it, uh, like the Mariano thing. That was really kind of silly. This this guy didn't understand baseball, the underwriter at all, uh, which was a blessing. He knew about being a reliever and a starter, but he was convinced that if he became a starter, it might put more of a strain. So that's when we put that clause in there, assuring him that, well, the policy would be void if he started. He never started another game, but it is expensive. And in some areas, yeah, it, it is expensive. Well, right now, the Yankees in the last few years have had two players that they've collected on, Ellsbury mm-hmm. uh, and uh, John Carlos Stanton. How much they've collected, I don't know the exact number. But uh, anyway, it is very, very expensive, though. That's true. Mm. All right. Bill, that was a fascinating talk. Anybody have anything else they want to ask Bill real fast? About umpiring? Insurance? Whatever? <laughs> right. know. We just lucked out having a couple of insurance guys here. I don't know anything about insurance. <laughs> so, hey, Bill, I, Bill, I've got a story you probably haven't heard. So uh, I had a cousin, Ricky, from Albuquerque that uh, was transferred to San Diego when I was living there to be uh, represent the Navy as the um, bodybuilder. And uh, he worked at Balboa Hospital in San Diego. So he stayed with me and my wife for about six months while he was stationed there. And then uh, he goes back to Albuquerque and the next year during baseball season, he called me at like 3.30 in the morning and uh, said, Uncle Fred, Uncle Fred, you're not going to believe this. I said, you're all right? Yeah, everything okay? Because it's 3.30 in the morning. He said, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. I went to the club tonight, and I met this lady, and she took me back to her place, and I about fainted. And I said, what's, what ha- what's the matter? And she says, she's got a CD of Joe West's album sitting on the counter. <laughs> that one. album right here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And he and there's only like 500 of them in the country. I got one. It's a good record. Blue so, she got, so I asked, he, I said, well, did you ask her why she, how she got it? And he said, no. Oh, here she is. Hey, hey, how come you got this CD? I hear him talking to her. How come you got this CD of Joe West? She says, oh, my ex-husband was an umpire. <laughs> and oh, my God, I'm out of here. I don't want to know. <laughs> what are the odds of that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Oh, no. I have one thing to add, Bill. Yeah. And I do have that Joe West album that you mentioned several times about banging on the trash cans and the Astros. So the St. Paul Saints had a giveaway this year, and you could <laughs> order one on mail. <laughs> and some of the guys have seen this already, but it's a combination of, uh, as, uh, Oscar the Grouch. It's Astro the Grouch in the garbage can. Yeah, That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. I, we are, uh, you know, the minor leagues have come up once or twice here in the conversation. I, I'm really worried. I have no idea what's, I don't think any of us know what's going to happen with minor league baseball. It's, uh, it's going to be a big. Uh, I, they're, they're, uh, some of these Eastern League teams, I think, are become, going to become minor league affiliates. 
a lot of mm -hmm. talk about that right now. Well, so much of this depends upon the pandemic, but obviously Major League Baseball is dependent upon their development program. There's going to have to be some means yeah. of the younger players having an opportunity to play. One of, most of them have already sacrificed it's now one year in, in, uh, in their development, and that's crucial. And uh, one up, but again, uh, Sam, so much of this depends upon upon the overall uh, overall climate from a health and pandemic standpoint and uh, so whether we have vaccines and whether whether people are going to be admitted in ballparks there's a lot of unknowns but obviously baseball has to make every effort to try to find some way uh, to get uh, to get minor league baseball back in action next year so I mean, if, we, if we've got a, if we've got a few minutes uh, I found Bill's comments very interesting I know you live in Boston and you've been a big Red Sox fan. And you've written a lot of books about the Sam, about the Red Sox. Can you fill us in just briefly on your background well, uh, as to how you got interested in baseball? And, and, and uh, well, it, I've got a varied background. Uh, the my father sold hot dogs at Fenway Park in 1937 and 1938 when he was trying to raise money to go to the 1939 World's Fair in New York, but. When I asked him he, for more about things like what was my first game I ever went to, he wasn't enough of a historian, so he couldn't remember. The first games project game I wrote up for Sabres Games Project, though, I wrote up my son's first game so that that situation would never happen again. My son was six, year, six weeks old when we took him to his first game, and I took him into the first aid room to get to change his diaper at one point. And they said, we just installed this station. And I said, so he's the first kid that ever had his diaper changed on it. And they said, that's right. <laughs> About three years ago, I decided to go back. He's 20 something now, uh, I just, he's 29. I decided to go back and try to put up a little plaque that said it was just, you know, he was, uh, had his, he was the first person to have his diaper changed there, but the rooms changed. It. Changing stations gone. That that plan was frustrated. I don't know. I just I just grew up in the area. I was born in 1945. Ted Williams was hit one of his greatest years was 1957. He hit 388, the year that he turned 39 years old. Imagine that, just on it on the face of it. But uh, I I thought he was going to get a hit every time he went up. And I started going to games by myself around that time. Uh, I could get in for 50 cents. I could take the tra public transportation in Boston for five cents each way because I was under 14 years old. And I, I just started going to a, a lot of baseball games on my own. Uh, I just became a fan the way I guess some kids did. But I went to, I went to college. I graduated. I got a PhD in political science. I taught college for about 12 years. The same month I started teaching, I started a record company. That's why I have Joe West CD at hand, because uh, we specialize a lot in uh, country and bluegrass folk music and so forth. But our company, what's today? Our company turns 50 years old in three days. On October 22nd, that'll be our 50th birthday. Uh, that was my second career. And then I, we, I, I kind of, well, we sold the company seven years ago. And since that time, I've really plunged with both feet into baseball, writing, researching. Uh, and uh, I was writing up game two of the 1903 World Series uh, about two hours ago. And so I'll, I'll resume work on that later. I, I just enjoy uh, doing a lot of this research. I hope that the bug, Gets caught by. I'm, I, I really worry about young people getting involved in baseball. I'm used to, like a lot of kids, I used to play in the backyard. I, it was down the street. We fixed the field up ourselves. One of the neighbors let us take his field and put a, you know, flatten it out and stuff like that. I, the kids these days, I don't, you know, I don't see kids playing baseball on their own. Maybe soccer, maybe shooting some baskets and so forth, but I don't see kids playing baseball on their own very much. And I, I worry about that a lot. What's your fondest Red Sox memory, 67 or 04 or something since then? Uh, well, 04 is a pretty good memory, actually. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, 
different ones. I, I was one of the first, I was there when the Red Sox clinched the pennant in 67. I've got to get their video sometime and, and find myself because I was one of the first people out to the mound in time to clap Jim Lonborg on the back, which he didn't really appreciate, but and I don't know what <laughs> I was thinking. But the, the, uh, there was just no security. They weren't expecting that. They had 8,000 people at opening day that year at Fenway Park because the team was terrible in the middle 60s. And it was that one year that, that kind of brought the team back. They weren't prepared for people rushing the field. Uh, I was at, let's say, 64. I was at Dave Moorhead, pitched a no-hitter. There were 1,241 people and me in the park. And I've, I've seen a couple other no-hitters. I was at Roger Clemens' 20, first 20 strikeout game. That was, a, that was an impressive one. I saw Carlton Fisk hit his home run in game six of the 1975 World Series. I, I, these days, I go to about 50 or 60 games a year. I went to 22 games this year. As I was able to get in, uh, I have a, a press pass that I can, they, they know me at, at the ballpark. I went out to Buffalo to see the Red Sox play a major league game in Buffalo. I thought that was kind of entertaining experience. But, uh, How was the stadium in Buffalo? Well, you know, it, but this is weird. The, uh, it, it was, seemed nice. I mean, it's 15,000 people. So, but, and it's old now. It's been there for 20, 30, 20 some years. Um, but it was a nice stadium. It's just with the pandemic and all, they're very cautious about this year. They were very careful about things. So when we got there, you know, you have to sign in, get your temperature checked, fill out a questionnaire and all that kind of stuff. And then there was a, a walk that my seat was pre-designated, separated from other people. And there was a, I was escorted to my seat. I couldn't just wander around the ballpark. I was escorted to my seat. They showed me where the men's room was. They showed me where there was some food you could get. And that was it. You weren't allowed to, to wander. Normally, I would do the whole circuit of the ballpark and wander around. But it was they were very cautious, and I, I respected that. I just I don't know favorite memory. I, I I was there when the Red Sox actually won the World Series at home in 2013. It's the first time they'd won at home for 95 years because it was 28 in 1918. They having one in St. Louis in 2004 and in Colorado in 2007. That was nice to see uh, the celebration in front of the home, home stand. I, I've got a lot of good memories over time. Seen some, have some bad memories too, but that's part of the trauma of being a Red Sox fan that helped make 2004 all that extra special. What's your biggest selling record? Alison Krauss is our biggest selling artist. Oh, she's good. Before that, it was uh, George Thurgood and the Destroyers. And his song, Move It On Over, ended up being a staple in an awful lot of ballparks. They, they would play that one. But um, yeah, Allison, we signed her when she was 13 years old. And she's gone on to become, win more Grammy Awards than any other female recording artist ever. Aretha Franklin and, and all. It recorded an awful lot of obscure people too. Do you remember Doctor Strange Club? Do I, I, him, I don't remember as well. I think I maybe tuned out on him. I, I remember <laughs> him being there, but there are some players that I followed more than others. And uh, there are also years I, because of whatever, I, I went to University of Chicago for a couple of years for graduate school, and so there were years that I wasn't around the ballpark as much. And Bill Lee. Bill Lee, uh, yeah, uh, he was uh, he was enjoyable. I took the I took the cover photo for one of his his books, uh, according to Chairman, whatever it was called. I can't remember the name of the book. Chairman Lee or something like that. He was posed holding his book up as though it was Chairman Mao. You know. All right. I really appreciate that the Red Sox have given me access in recent years, and I certainly. Uh, Enjoyed being a kind of a super fan. The rhetoric coming from yeah, yeah. the left. All right. Good stuff, Bill. Good stuff. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Thank you. I enjoyed, uh, uh, I always enjoy talking about baseball research and talking with Sabre members. And it's one of the advantages of what we're all doing is getting to see people from other, other parts of the country. Yeah. 
I just hope we can all get together again. Uh, I hope we have a convention and enough people can make it this coming summer. We should see have it. you recorded any baseball players like maybe Barry Zito? No, no. Mm. Not yet. <laughs> all right. Um, it looks like we got time for our trivia contest. Um, I just wanted to make a, one announcement that I forgot when we first started, but uh, our, our next newsletter is set to come out on Halloween. Mm. So That's right, Bob, right? Halloween? Yes. <laughs> and um, so we are looking forward to that. That'll be uh, edition two. Um, you know, we, we got to love good stuff. Uh, Scott emailed me today. Uh, got a lot of good stuff, and we're always looking for more material for future editions. And uh, you know, if you want to get in the uh, baseball in the, the writing business, hey, that's a, that's a good place to start. So send your stuff. Um, he, he mentioned here with well, all the deaths of Hall of Fame players, you can ask members to write personal remembrances of the deceased for the next couple of issues, things like that. So. Uh, if you're interested in publishing, uh, writing for the next edition, the articles are due by January 15th. So uh, you got a month, month and a half. Um, are we limiting people to 500 words? Is that no. something? What's that? No? no, we're not. Okay. All right. I didn't think so. <laughs> Bob. If you want to write a thousand words, go ahead and write a thousand words. Whatever it takes to tell the story. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so we have a trivia contest, uh, and that'll be the last thing we do. Uh, Maxwell, this is you, right? Right. Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Bill, for uh, for uh, your entertaining stories about the umpires and the Red Sox and the round of records and talking about people holding up books. I was actually holding up one of yours, oh, yeah. uh, Mr. Red Sox by Johnny Pesky. And oh. I don't know if you remember the inscription that you signed when you signed it. Maybe this will be the year, Bill Nowlin. What year did I find this? In April of two thousand and four. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh wow! Man, that's worth that me. So that not, not a bad, not too shabby a year for the Red Sox, I don't think. Hey Maxwell, who wrote the foreword for that book? Number nine. I thought that was pretty cool. I think so. <laughs> I wrote it, but he uh, he signed <laughs> off on it. Really, <laughs> that's a great story too. <laughs> A hey, great job tonight, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Anyways, my trivia contest tonight. Uh, the last one had a theme, and this one has a theme as well. Uh, tonight's theme is Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle's birthday would have been tomorrow. He would have been 89 years old. So I've got a series of questions that are all, all relate to Mickey Mantle. And since I set this contest, one of Mickey Mantle's teammates and close friends on the Yankees passed away, and that was Whitey Ford. So as a tribute to Whitey Ford, when we get to the question where he's the correct answer, that's the secret square. So for every point you get right on that one, you score two points. So the first, first question, Mickey Mantle's childhood favorite team was the reigning World Series champion when he was born on October 20, 1931. Which team was this? That's for one point. Okay. Mickey Mantle's favorite team growing up. Question number two, also one point. Which of Mickey Mantle's teammates won the American League Rookie of the Year Award in 1951? Number three. On April 17th, 1953, this is for three points. On April 17th, 1953, Mickey Mantle hit the first tape measure home run. In which ballpark was the home run hit? What pitcher surrendered it? And how far did it travel? Hmm. Number four, this is for two points. Mickey Mantle considered the 1956 season my favorite summer. In fact, he and Phil Pepe wrote a book together with this as the title. In 1956, Mickey Mantle became the second New York Yankee to win the Triple Crown. Name the first to win and the year he won. That's two points.
And this is this next one's a yes or no question. Am I going too quickly? <laughs> Take that as a no. Number five. This is for three points. Mickey Mantle won the American League MVP award three times. 1956, 1957, and 1962. Who finished second in the league each of those years? And Bill gave us a clue earlier on tonight as to who one of the three was. It was 57. What was the other one? 56, 57, and 62. Okay. Not the same person every year. No, no. Number six for three points. Roger Maris led the American League with 61 home runs in 1961. Mickey Mantle was second with 54. And three players between the two leagues each hit 46. Name those three players for three points. Number seven. During the 1962 World Series, the opposing San Francisco Giants featured a marquee player who shared October 20th as a birthday with Mickey Mantle. Who was he for one point? What year? 62. Okay. Could you repeat the question? Of course. During the 1962 World Series, the opposing San Francisco Giants featured a marquee player who shared October 20th as a birthday with Mickey Mantle. Who was he? Number eight, this is for one point. Mickey Mantle hit the first indoor home run in a preseason exhibition game at the Astrodome in 1965. Where did Mantle stand in the batting order that game? Some of you were probably there. <laughs> Number nine, between 1951 and 1968, nine Mantle teammates Won 20 games in a season for the Yankees. Name each of the nine. Oh, my God. Repeat that. <laughs> yeah. Between 1951 and 1968, nine different Mantle teammates won 20 games in a season for the Yankees. Name the players. If you need a bit of time on this one? Yes, 51 to 68. 51 to 68. Nine 20 game winners on the Yankees. Shall I proceed? Are we still working on it? Okay. Mark said no. One more minute. One more minute? Okay. Can name all the 20 game winners from this year. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Anyone win 10 games this year? No. Imagine. I don't know. I honestly, I'm not sure. Just, hey, is anybody glad the Astros lost so they didn't have to play the Dodgers so we'd hear about the revenge? In no. doubt. <laughs> Number 10. Also for nine points. Name the last Yankees players to wear each of the single digit uniform numbers, number one through nine, before they were retired. <laughs> Would you please repeat that? Of course. Name the last Yankees players to wear each of the single uniform, each of the single digit uniform numbers, one through nine, before they were retired. Six. 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 
So we need help with number six. Yeah. Number six only played one year for the Yankees. He was more famous with the Blue Jays. Oh, uh, okay. Good, good question, though. Thank you. <laughs> There'll be some interesting answers to that one. What was question number four? Mickey Mantle considered the 1956 season my favorite summer. In fact, he and Phil Pepe wrote a book together with this as the title. In 1956, Mantle became the second New York Yankee to win the Triple Crown, named the first and the year he won. Are we ready for number 11? Yep. Sure. Number 11, excluding the pitcher, the catcher, and the center fielder. Name the Yankee starting lineup on October 8th, 1956. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. You got Stratomatic, you'll probably remember. <laughs> hey, listen, everybody, I'm going to take off. I'm going to go watch the news. <laughs> All right. I, I stink at trivia, so I, uh, I, this is the most complicated trivia question, quiz I've ever heard. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Thank Thanks you, Thanks Bill. again, Bill. Great job. Yeah. Thanks, Great Bill. job, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. And are we ready for number 12? Number 12 is the last question. 13 points. One point. <laughs> One point. With which author did Mickey Mantle co-write All My Octobers? I know the last boy. <laughs> yeah. So there's 40 points in all. Are there, are there any questions anybody wants me to repeat? We're all... How about number 11? Number 11? Excluding the pitcher, the catcher, and the center fielder, name the Yankees starting lineup on October 8th, 1956. We're at six points. Eric Mantle. <laughs> wow. You ready for me to take up the, the, the answers? Yeah. Now there's 40 points, points in total. And bear in mind that one of the questions is worth double points. So Which one? The one where Whitey Ford is one of the correct answers. Okay. Oh. So who guessed number one? I did. Cardinals. Cardinals is correct. Yep. Everyone who says Cardinals gets a point. Yay. Rookie of the year in 1951? Gil McDougal. McDougal. Gil McDougal is correct. Oman exporter. How many points is that worth? That's worth one point. As you go through the answers, Maxwell, it would really, really help if you'd remind us how many points with each. Certainly will. Yeah, Mike, Mike might put six on that one. Yeah, that was worth <laughs> 10, wasn't it? <laughs> Number three, three points. Senators. Pedro Ramos, 565 feet. Chuck Stobbs. Chuck, Chuck Stobbs. Stobbs. Yeah, Chuck Stobbs, Stobbs, 565. Chuck Stobbs is correct. Griffith Stadium, 565 feet. Yep. If you hit 563, you round it off, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> How many points uh, on that if one? You're, three. If you're close, we'll give it three. to you. Three. So how much is two out of three worth? Two out of three ain't bad. I know, but how much is it worth on this quiz? Two points. Zero. Two points. Zero. Okay. Two points. <laughs> Not six. <laughs> he didn't hit it off Whitey Ford. He, he, he did hit a home run in an all-star game or in an old-timers game off Whitey Ford, but not the tape measure. Number four, two points. The Triple Crown winner. Garrick? Lou Garrick? Garrick. Lou Garrick's correct. One Name point. 34. Night. Well done, Mike. Okay. Mike. That wasn't Mike, that was Tony. Oh, it was Tony. I thought it was Mike. 
That was no, I said Mark. how many points? One point? One, that two was points. Mark. Two points. That was Mark. Two, two, two points. points for Gehrig? Yeah. Two points. Two, one point for Gehrig, one point for 34. You get an extra point if you were at the games? <laughs> no, that's five points. <laughs> I got to sign baseball from there when I was at the game. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, three points. The second place MVP award winners. 57 is Ted Williams. 57 is Ted Williams. Got that one. Uh, Maris in 62? No. Oh, Maris. Wild guess, 56, Roy Sievers. P incorrect. They were both Yankees. 56. Who said Barra? Me, Biley. Dick, you got it right. What uh, year, Dick? 56. That's 56. So we're he missing 62? 62. Infielder. Richardson. Richardson? Bobby Richardson's correct. Holy mm. cow. So one point apiece? Yep. One point. Okay. Number six, one point apiece. The three players who hit 46 home runs in 1961. Gentile. Gentile was one of them. Norm Cepeda. Cash. Cepeda's correct. Right. Oh, okay. And Killebrew? Norm Cash. In the American? Carmen Killebrew's correct. Yeah, Cash had 41 that year. Yeah. Oh, man. So, Gentile, Killebrew, and Cepeda? That's right. Okay. Eight. Three, okay. One point apiece? One point apiece. I didn't get Killebrew. Number seven. One point. Who on the 62 Giants was born on October 20th? McCovey? Nope. Mace? Ada? Nope. Marichal. Marichal's correct. Oh, okay. 20, 1937. Where was Mantle in the batting order when... Lead yeah. off. Lead Lead off. off. Well done, Mark. <laughs> I was there. Hell, you must have been the bat boy. <laughs> I was there. I win. <laughs> Number nine for nine points. This is brutal. Ford. Turley. Ford. Ford's correct, which means which means every point you get is worth two points on this question. Bob Grimm. Bob Grimm's correct. Bob Grimm. Bob Turley. Ralph Terry. Ralph Terry. Terry's correct. Bob Turley. Bob Turley's Jim correct. Jim Bowden. Jim Bowden. Jim Bowden is correct. That's correct. I don't have any more. Rashi. Dick Rashi's correct. Allie Reynolds. Yes. Wow. Uh, Gidry, Ron Gidry. Ron Gidry wasn't playing yet. No, he was 70 uh, something. This stops at 68. How about Eddie Lopat? Uh, yeah, two we Lopat. haven't mentioned? Stan Bonson. Eddie Lopat? Yeah. Stan Bonson. And Mel Stottlemyer. Stottlemyer. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You want me to read? You want me to read them over again? Yeah. Eddie Lopat, Vic Rashi, Ali Reynolds, Bob Grimm, Bob Turley, Ralph Terry, sure. Whitey Ford, Jim Bouton, and Mel Stottlemyre. Okay, I got five, so that's worth ten points. That's ten. I got that's, ten. Ten, I got, that's ten. ten then, huh? Okay. Six. Trying to keep a running total here. However many you get, multiply it by two. I got 12 points there. <laughs> Gives you 13. Now the, <laughs> the retired numbers. <laughs> Jeter. Jeter is not the last number two. Martin Jeter. Ruth, Gary, Corey. Tori wasn't a player for the Yankees. DiMaggio's five. DiMaggio's Is five. Number one? Was that Bill Billy Dickey. Martin? Bill oh. Dickey. Nope. Bill, uh, Billy Martin was the, was was managing was the last one. Um, Bobby Richardson? Nope. Read the, no. read the question again. All right. Name the last Yankees players to wear each of the single-digit uniform numbers one through nine before before the numbers okay. were retired. Okay, let's do this systematically. One was well, Jeter. Oh wait, one, is it Steinbrenner? Steinbrenner? No. <laughs> <laughs> one was Bobby Mercer. He would Mercer. Oh my Mercer. goodness! 
Bobby Bobby was Marty Mercer. Oh. Matt Martin. Two was Derek Jeter. Okay. Ruth, Garrick, DiMaggio. Yeah. You're Cliff. right as far as De Garrick and DiMaggio. Number three, the last number three was actually Cliff Mapes. Wow. That's a good trivia. That's a good question. The last number six was Tony Fernandez. Oh. Oh, now I get the question. Last why number did they seven retire was number six? Sorry? Uh, Warrior? I mean, why did they retire six? I didn't know. Tory. Oh, Joe Tory? Yeah. Hmm. Num number seven was Mickey Mantle. Berra. Number Yogi. eight was Yogi Berra. And Bears. Yeah. Number nine, Greg Nettles. Greg mm -hmm. Nettles. Now the starting the starting lineup on the uh wait a minute. I got six, so six points. That's right. Number eleven, six points up for grabs. Excluding the pitcher, the catcher, and the center fielder, named the Yankee starting lineup on October eighth, nineteen fifty six. That Gil Larson's McDougal. perfect game. That's Larson's perfect game. Gil McDougal. Yep, McDougal was the shortstop. Scourin. Scourin. Scourin did not play. Ooh. Bauer. Bauer is the right fielder. Gene Woodling. Nope. Richard Andy Carey. Not Cleet Richardson. Boyer. Andy Carey. Mickey Andy Carey was third base. Who? Uh, who? Andy Carey was third base. Yep. Yeah. Mantle was in there. He was in center. We're not counting him. Pitcher, catch. Yeah, we need oh, left well, and I right fielder one. and the Hector Lopez. Fielders. We got right. All right. I'll, I'll tell you the ones. I'll tell you the ones we haven't got. Joe Collins was first base. Oh, oh my goodness. Enos Slaughter was left field. Huh. Enos Slaughter. Oh, and God. and Billy Martin was second base. And the others wow. we got: Bauer, McDougal, and Carey. Yeah, I don't think I and One point apiece. One point apiece. Two. I got two of them. And the last one for one point. Who did Mantle co author All My Octobers with? Bill Nolan. Herskowitz. Herskowitz is correct. Oh. <laughs> paper member. That's a great quiz. Thank you. Thanks. Now let's see who gets to. Um, who the winner is, and the prize of setting the next month's trivia contest. <laughs> I mean, did, anyone got get, ten. did anyone get 10 points? Yes. Anybody get 15? Yeah. yeah. Whose hands are up? Uh, Mike, Mark, Bob, Fred, Dick. 20? Anybody get 20? Yes. A lot of people had 20. 25. Tony, Mike, Mark, Fred, 30? No. <laughs> no, nobody. 29. Oh, I want Mark got Mark. Mark had 30, I think. I had 29, but Mark had his hand up. It's like 30. Mark's the winner there. Mark's the winner. I've got 35 if I added right. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, wow. All you gotta, right. You do the next you gotta, two you quizzes. You've got to do the trivia question <laughs> two times in a row. But yeah. I, I, I agree with Fred. <laughs> I, I don't have time to do the trivia questions. <laughs> I, just give me my prize. That is the prize. That is the prize. You get to... That's a terrible prize. Who thought of that? <laughs> Second place is two times doing it. I uh, want money. Right. Well, I have yeah, 29. He, he was... Do I have to write it or is Mark going to write it? Well, I'm going to I'm going to show Mark his prize right now. I think Tal had 32. Uh, <laughs> I lost track. <laughs> Here we go, Mark. Here's your prize. Mickey Mantle autograph that I signed. Oh, oh that, that's priceless. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on eBay. Like you might have had a couple beers when and you wrote. I'll come visit him in jail. Good stuff. Congrats, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I grew All up right. a Yankee fan. Uh, Bob, Bob, do you have any, uh, do you have any uh, closing remarks, Bob? 
I got I got a couple comments. Number one, Mark, are you going to do the trivia next time? Yes or no? When is it? November sixteenth. Next, next meeting, November sixteenth, uh, right? Sixteenth. Can I have a backup <laughs> in case I panic? Uh, Joe, we pan. just need to know. We just need to know. Uh, well, Michael do it, but he's already done it several times. I, I'll give it a shot. Yes. Thank okay. You. I'll commit to doing it. That's number one. Uh, number two on the sixteenth, we've got Mike Vance as our guest speaker. Good. Who well, should be excellent? And we have Paul Rogers, who's also going to speak on Robin Roberts. Paul's the uh, ex-dean of the SMU Law Department. Um, so those are our speakers for the 16th of November. And on a personal note, a number of you sent me uh, cards and prayers, and I'm deeply appreciative of uh, your support of our, we had a little family tragedy, and uh, appreciate it very much. Thanks, Joe, for taking over tonight. It was really great. You're welcome, Bob. You're welcome. Anytime. Uh, well, I, I'm hopeful the Rays win because we just don't want anything good to happen to the Dodgers. I'll second that. <laughs> yeah. Let them become the Buffalo Bills of the ML, uh, uh, baseball, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the Bills uh, lost four in a row, right? Four Super Bowls in a row? <laughs> Let them become the bills of baseball. Hey I, hey, I sent a picture out to everybody about our manager, Dusty Baker. Did everybody get it? Yeah, uh, I got it. Okay. Where'd you send it, Fred? Yeah. You sent it in the it, chat. It in should the be chat. in the chat thing on your right side. It's Dusty Baker in drag. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not showing. <laughs> Just as well. <laughs> Hey Scott. hey Scott or Tony, do you have anything you want to say about the any more to say about the newsletter? Well, uh, I think it looks pretty good. Uh, Bill Brown's contribution on uh, Tom Seaver is just wonderful. So I think you'll all read that. And, and uh, uh, I, I think we have. Uh, I did want to qualify that second baseman thing. That was players that did 95% of their games at second. So Hornsby played, played first and third, too, so he wasn't on the list. But his war was 25 points higher than Morgan's. I looked that up. Wow. Wow. Biggio's center field days probably disqualified him. I was thinking, uh, Bill James said that Biggio was one of the great players of all time because he you know, was catcher, second base, center field. <laughs> And uh, as he said, he oh, he left uh, the plate running. So he was a Oh, no doubt player. about it. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Joe. And Joe, thanks. Everybody. Good quiz, Maxwell. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. No better times. <laughs> yeah, that was very good. <laughs> thanks. It's their times. Thank you. I guess that's it. Yes. I guess so. Okay. We'll see you later. Thank okay. you, fellas. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Bye. Everybody, take care. Thank you. Take care. Take care.